Thank you. Hello. A few years ago, I had a midlife crisis. <laughs> I was at a juncture in my life where big changes were looming, and uh, the biggest was that my sons were launching out off to college on their own lives, a wonderful transition. In response, I felt compelled to take on a big physical challenge, something so large it scared me a little bit. I looked to my favorite place, Lake Michigan, and I decided to get to know it step by step by walking all the way around it a journey of 1,000 miles. <laughs> Along the way, I hoped to stitch together all the pinpoint views I had of the lake through my many visits into one complete picture, one holistic picture of the lake. I also wanted to internalize it, to record it in my muscles and bones. My midlife crisis evolved into a midlife adventure. What I didn't expect was who I would meet along the way. I first saw Lake Michigan when I was only six years old. My sister and brother and I climbed into the way back of the station wagon and our parents drove us west to Warren Dune State Park. There we tumbled out of the car at the foot of the biggest pile of sand we had ever seen and we, we took off racing to the top of that dune. We not only had to struggle against the sand falling away as we climbed, but against the person losing the race, grabbing our legs and pulling us <laughs> backward. <laughs> when I finally got to the top, I was elated. But then I turned and I looked out on Lake Michigan. I was astonished. I had never seen a lake this large. You couldn't see the other side of it. It stretched left and right and forward to meet the sky. Blue and blue and blue. We took off racing toward the water, tumbling down that dune, heels overhead. We finally got to the edge and plunged into the cool embrace. From that time, I was, I was smitten. <laughs> I decided that Lake Michigan was my favorite place, and I've returned over and over again throughout my life. I began my hike in Chicago, just as winter was releasing its icy grip on the city. I headed south along the bottom edge of the lake and then back up into Michigan. 80 miles into the journey, I was at the foot of that pile of sand in Warren Dune State Park, and I watched as the shadow of that little girl I once was ran down the dune, tumbled, picked herself up, and then plunged into the lake. She got out of the water and started following me, asking questions about what our life had become. Listen, I'm a pretty driven person, a forward-looking person. I did not expect this. I was not looking for this. But consider, there are junctures in our lives that change us forever, where we are never the same person again, like getting married, like having kids, or even moving to a new place with a new job. These changes force us to evolve into new people, so where do our former selves go? For me, the shadows of who I was still resided along the edge of the place that united us all, Lake Michigan. There my echoes brightly shimmered. It was the place I was happiest throughout my life, the place I was most myself. I continued hiking and passed a place where I had gone swimming with college friends and my college age self joined the hike. I hiked on a beach that I had strolled hand in hand with my young husband and my newly married self joined the hike. I passed several vacation houses we had rented for a week during the summers, jamming them with my siblings and my cousins and my friends and all of our kids. And I heard the echoes of laughter from those times and I met myself as a young mother. I paused by little streams where the kids would gather and dam it up with rocks and sand. You know how they do that all the time? <laughs> Until they had a huge backlog of water, and then they break the dam and they watch their kid-made wave crash into the Lake Michigan waves. And I saw my sons as those little boys again. And I realized how much I missed them. I loved the young men my sons were growing into, loved them. But I still miss those little boys. 
At the next vacation house, their shadows were a little taller, and I got to watch them grow up because I dragged them to the beach with me all the time. <laughs> I found it was fascinating to chat with my former selves. They had a lot of questions, and in answering them, I got a deeper understanding of my life and my decisions I had made so far. I couldn't change the past, but it gave me perspective. I told them what we had become, a scientist, a wife, a mother, a writer, and now, quite unexpectedly, an adventurer, a long-distance hiker. My six-year-old self was pretty jazzed about this, and she skipped along <laughs> at my side. Some of my older selves were a little dubious about the whole long hike thing, but they also came along. <laughs> We continued hiking into the northern parts of the lake, the more remote and wild parts. And at Sleeping Bear Dunes along Platte Bay, I checked in at the ranger station and got a campsite for the night. There, the ranger told me to be careful that there was a cougar prowling the park. Now, I've been close to black bear before, close enough to smell them, that musky, feral smell of a wild animal. I'm not too afraid of black bear. They usually sense you and run off. Or if you do happen to see them, you make a lot of noise and act real big and they'll take off. But a cougar, you'll never see them. They jump on your back and bite your neck before you even know they're around. So I was really concerned <laughs> because I'm pretty sure my neck is delicious. <laughs> I set up camp, and since I had hiked uh, many, many miles that day, I fell into a deep sleep. The night was unexpectedly cold, though, and I woke up shivering and slept little through the chilly night. At first light, when it started warming up, I broke camp, <laughs> shouldered my pack, and headed north along Platte Bay. As I hiked with a tall perch dune to my right and the lake to my left, the band of sand I could walk on narrowed. Soon I came upon a freshly killed deer, and I remembered the cougar warning. The wind was swirling around, though, rustling all the bushes on the face of the dune. The cougar could be anywhere. It'd be very difficult to see it. I continued hiking and came upon another deer kill, and then another. This narrow strip of sand was a hunting corridor, and I was walking on top of the buffet table. <laughs> I remembered that cougars never attack from the front, so cleverly I began hiking backward. <laughs> but then I tripped over a piece of driftwood and almost fell, which I thought would be like ringing the cougar dinner bell. I faced forward and pushed myself to hike faster when I first smelled it, that musky, feral smell of a wild animal. And it wasn't a black bear killing all these deer, but a cougar. I hiked faster. The, the sweat beaded on my forehead, and I felt it trickling down my back. I scanned the face of that dune, but all I could see were the bushes rustling in the wind. The cougar could hide anywhere. I would not be able to see it. I hiked faster and faster. The smell got stronger and stronger. It surrounded me. I lifted my arm to wipe the sweat off my forehead, and I realized that the smell surrounded me because it was me. <laughs> <laughs> Hiking for days, sleeping in my shirt, <laughs> and running from a cougar had made me the one that smelled like a musky, feral, wild animal. <laughs> I stopped and began to laugh, and soon I was doubled over with laughter, and then I heard my former <coughs> selves join in. I've always been able to laugh at myself. When I finally caught my breath, I looked out at the expanse of Lake Michigan. And in that moment, I felt my former selves coalesce back into me. Those pinpoint views I had of my life knitted together into a holistic one. So, consider, where can you find your former selves? Where do they brightly shine? And what do they have to say to you? Thank you. <laughs>